everyone, and welcome to our series at Vivian Health called On the Horizon in Healthcare. My name is Dr. Beth Brooks, and I'm the clinical advisor here at Vivian Health. And today we want to be very excited because we have a special guest joining us today. Each month I do a short video talking about recruitment and retention and different evidence-based strategies that you might implement at your organization. But then every once in a while, I like to bring some of my colleagues in who can share their particular expertise. So today we have Dr. Leslie Kelly, and uh, <laughs> Leslie is a nurse scientist at Common Spirit. And so we're going to spend some time today talking about what is a nurse scientist and what does she do in her work day to day? But let me first tell you a little bit about Leslie. She leads the nursing research for Common Spirit Health. So I'm sure many of you have heard it's a very large integrated healthcare delivery system with 150,000 employees and 45,000 nurses, which is, is, is mind blowing how many nurses that is. And Common Spirit is in 21 states and has a thousand different sites of care. And um, Dr. Kelly is also on the faculty at Arizona State University and is an assistant clinical professor. So she's got that dual role, but she started as a registered nurse. I'm going to let her tell her story and, and how she found herself in this role, but she's worked in patient care in academia and health system administration. And she's received many, many awards and honors and excellence in education and research and practice. And she's been published in many peer-reviewed journals. She earned her PhD at the University of Arizona and completed a postdoc research fellowship at the University of Pennsylvania Center for Health Outcomes and Policy Research. And for those of you who read a lot, you know that that's where Linda Aiken has done a lot of her work. So Leslie has been in, has done her postdoc at University of Pennsylvania, and she's also a fellow in the American Academy of Nursing. So welcome, Leslie. Yay. Mm -hmm. I'm so glad you're here. And I always, I was telling you, every time I get to see you at g and &E, I always make it a point to have a more, one of my morning walks with you so you can share with me interesting research that you've read or things that you think I'd be interested in, or you share some of your work. So I just so much enjoy spending time with you because you have your ear to the ground about what's important and what's being studied out in the world or nursing. So welcome. Talk research. Yes. <laughs> so start at the beginning. Like, how did you know that what is a nurse scientist? First of all, you know, what, what does that mean, especially in your setting? And how did you know that this is what you wanted to do? Yes. Well, I guess all roads lead back to my mother, like many in nursing. Um, so my mother's a nurse and I actually didn't think I'd go right into nursing. I, I dabbled around in college, biology, public health, but I shadowed a physician during college and I absolutely said that is not for me. After I watched them chase the DRG and deal with insurance companies and I said, no, you know, it needs to be more about the person and more about making a difference. And so so when I kind of went public health and then it just kind of dawned on me, I have 20 nurses in my family. Why am I not going into nursing? But I think like a lot of people, nursing school was rough and uh, hopefully it's gotten better. But as I was in nursing school, I don't think I was my nursing instructor's favorite. <laughs> I would be in my clinicals and I would be taking care of my patients one-on-one, -on -one, but I am a systems thinker. And so my brain was always up here and I was kind of thinking like how the unit is running, what the nurse manager is doing. And again, that kind of goes back to my mother. She was a nursing director at the time. You know, I was coming in with her at night and helping do parties for the staff. And we were talking about staffing and calling nurses in. I was learning about hours per patient day. I always joke that our dog knew how to do hours per patient day. My brain wasn't always in that one-on-one -on -one patient interaction. And so as I was completing nursing school in like my fourth semester, my mom was actually entering into a doctoral program. So I got to learn about graduate school and about the opportunities for nurses in graduate school. And I actually got to learn that my program had a fast track program for BSN to PhD. Mm -hmm. So whether it was the right decision or the wrong decision, very shortly after my BSN, I went into my PhD program. Mm -hmm. And I credit that to a faculty member that said, I asked, I said, should I spend a lot of time, you know, gaining clinical experience if I want to do research, if I have this systems 
desire and this desire to improve things at a systems level. And she said, you know, why would you spend, you know, decades of experience on the clinicals when you could spend decades making a difference in research? She said, go right away. So I took that advice. I went straight into my PhD program. That was rough too. (laughs) You know, it it took a lot of hard work, a lot of reading and working at the same time. And whether that's a good decision or not, I knew I had to get that clinical experience as well. Got to be able to walk the walk as nurses. And so I worked tele. I worked pre and post cath lab. I worked as an educator. I did some consulting for the Arizona Nurses Association. And then I completed my PhD. And then the really funny thing is when I got done with my PhD, I said, oh, I really don't even know how to do anything in research either. And that's when I decided I needed to do a postdoc because that's kind of your residency, your preceptorship Mm -hmm. for being a nurse researcher or a nurse scientist. And so that's where I really learned how to do research was in my postdoc. So you are probably one of the very few nurses who finished their PhD pretty young, I'm I'm assuming. If you went from the BSN. 27, yeah. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, that's very unusual because most of us, you know, a couple of years of clinical experience, maybe go back and get a master's degree, work a little bit more with that degree, and then go back. I think I was probably... 36 when I finished. And that to me felt young compared to some of my classmates. So that's amazing that you were, you were so young. So when you did your postdoc, like, how did you decide? Because we know many hospitals, we see the title nurse scientist and normally or often it's some affiliated or associated with the magnet program, but then doing a postdoc, you are in an academic setting. So how did you decide do I stay in academia, which would be more, I think everyone understands that nurse scientists are in academia, but then you decided to go on onto the provider side. So how did you decide which path to take? After? Yeah, I get asked this question a lot. And, you know, as I finished my postdoc, I knew that my work was still in acute care. The protected time of doing research is in the university. And I guess I really wanted both worlds, but also I knew I was still novice even after my postdoc. And so my goal was really to have a foot in both worlds um, because I still needed to learn nursing. I mean, I still at that point was only 29. And so I still needed to learn nursing as well. And I was so fortunate to have colleagues. Dr. Jennifer Mensick at the time was creating a position within Banner Health for a research director, but it was a 0.5 position. So I came back to Arizona and interviewed and was offered that position. And I went over to Arizona State University and I said, I have this 0.5 position for a research director. I said, I'd really love to be an academic research fellow as well. And so I would talk to Dr. Burnham Melnick at the time and said, can I, you know, start my academic journey as well? And just so kind and offering a 0.5 research assistant professor at the time as well. So not tenure track, but still learning. And so I really had the best of both worlds, as long as I set those boundaries about having Mm -hmm. two part-time jobs. And for, you know, half a decade, I was able to do both and really be in the acute care setting, still learning nursing, walking hand in hand with the nurses on the floor, doing research, doing EVP, learning the things that I needed to learn. And then being in the university setting, submitting our O3s, teaching classes, doing all of the traditional academic research work. Lasted for a while. It was a little too good to be true. As you ran ran a little dry and went both worlds and then decided, you know, somebody finally said, okay, before you burn out, let's pick a track here. And Mm -hmm. I decided to go tenure track at Arizona State and go down in my appointment at the hospital. They pulled in an EVP director. So I stuck to just research at Banner and moved forward doing more research at ASU. And it really, you know, this is kind of the advice I give. You have to learn how to do research and the academic setting is really the best place for that. You have all your mentors your colleagues, hopefully you have a research environment that supports you. But had I been on my own in the hospital, I don't know if I could have done that. I kept calling on my colleagues from Penn who were so supportive, you know, whenever I had study questions or needed advice. And so that helped move me forward. And I was able to do 10 and a half years in both places before I accepted the nurse scientist position at Common Spirit Health. Wow. So talk a little bit about some of those early studies. You said you liked that systems thinking and influencing what was happening. So what were some of the early studies that you started to to do and think about? 
Yeah, it was really a blend between what interests me, but what also came out of the spirit of inquiry from the nurses and what were the problems driving those clinical questions, which I think that's just absolutely great. I was on some researcher off, you know, in my ivory tower studying what I wanted to study. Like we were studying what was actually Mm -hmm. driving the questions. The work that was done at the Center for Health Policy Research with Dr. Reagan, so powerful, so important. And so I was able to pick up some of those strings of those trajectories. My first study that I did in my postdoc just happened to be on nurse burnout in the difference between magnet and non-magnet hospitals. And so when I kind of carried that through, when I came back to Arizona, we started talking about kind of, you know, what is the difference in different units and kind of burnouts. And we happened to talk about meaningful recognition and kind of why nurses stay and why they don't. And there was a really wonderful neuro ICU nurse who talked about leaving and never knowing how her patients did and how she thought about it. And so we really just kept with that burnout trajectory and kind of how they don't, they don't always know what happens to their patients and it makes them have these intrusive thoughts and they want to leave. And we just had long conversations about this. And remember, this is long before the pandemic, you know, this was 2011, 2012. And so we did a descriptive study looking at different factors of specialties and and burnout and recognition. And at the time, we just happened to say, well, let's look at DAISY nomination as a proxy for meaningful recognition. And we looked at other factors as well. And and we kind of carried this trajectory of meaningful recognition along. We did find that those nurses that had received a DAISY nomination were significantly different in their burnout levels. And that ended up being like a series of studies. We worked off of that pilot study. We ended up partnering with the DAISY organization and looking at a really multi-hospital study of ICU nurses and the difference of DAISY. And then that went into looking at a study about the full healthy work environment spectrum using the AACN model for a healthy work environment and the factors that influence nurses related to their healthy work environment. So really moving forward with like this trajectory of Mm -hmm. characteristics that influence nurses and their burnout and clinician well-being. Well, and I, what's so interesting and great about your story that is that, you know, I'm not any way, shape or form as experienced or as expert as a researcher as you are. But inevitably, when you get to the end of a study, there's always those, oh, what about this? And what about that? And there's always those next questions. And so that's a perfect story of how one study leads to another question to another question. And I also remember a lot of your work with the DAISY Foundation. I mean, that was some of the very early, right? I mean, DAISY was you know, I remember it from the very beginning, but they were trying to, because I think at first people can go, oh, please, it's just another, you know, employee of the month, but it wasn't. And it was much more than that. And I think that early research really helped establish that as a really important program. And now look at DAISY. It's just, I mean, for those of you who are listening, who might not know, it's a program that you can implement at your hospital where patients and colleagues can nominate a nurse who has exemplary performance. And I was at a client site, this was about eight or 10 months ago, and a nurse had like seven daisy pins on her on her ID badge. So it's a really meaningful recognition for a nurse. And I can completely understand why that would um, mitigate some of those feelings of burnout because you know, you just look at your badge, you know that you've been acknowledged and recognized for great work. So that's that's really cool. So so talk a little bit about, you know, you said this a little earlier, lots and lots of hospitals have evidence-based practice, EBP. So evidence-based practice is about implementing a solution. So you're the nurse scientist. Are you working side by side or are you advisory? Like how does that work when there's a nurse scientist in the organization and they're actively doing evidence-based? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, EVP is like the foundation for everything we do, right? But it all starts with that spirit of inquiry, right? So we're, we're all in it to build that spirit of inquiry, ask the questions, question our practice, you know, make sure that we don't have any sacred cows or things that we do just for the sake of doing them, right? 
But when you start that and you get that ball rolling, if we all know the steps of this, right? We ask a question or we look at a problem and then we try to figure out what the evidence says about it. You don't know if it's going to go into a research question or an EVP question. You don't know the evidence base out there and what the literature says about it. And so when you have the support of both the researcher and an evidence-based practice coordinator or DMP prepared nurse to support it, you can really say, okay, you know, I've looked at the evidence and I say, there is no evidence to support this. Maybe we want to carry it forward and do a research study on this. And then a, a nurse scientist can support that and say, let's do a research study in this area. Or hopefully, you know, there's a strong and sufficient evidence base for this practice change. And we want to carry this forward and do an EVP project and support the implementation of this practice change. But you know, starting that process with that spirit of inquiry, likely you don't know where that's going to lead to. So I imagine you find yourself working and mentoring staff who are on that EVP journey, but then are you also mentoring other nurse scientists? Are there, are you that like, you know, common spirit, 115,000 employees, 45,000 nurses, 21 states. Are there more than one of you? I mean, how do you, how does an organization decide Or are you collaborating? Like, what's the role look like day to day when you're working for the health system? Yeah, absolutely. I wish there were a lot, a lot of us, but there's not enough of us, right? We are a small network. The nursing world in general is small. You know this. We all know each other and it's great to collaborate, but it would be great if there's even more. We do, you know, support each other. The thing is, we usually have, as you know, with a magnet coordinator, directors, or anybody in nursing, we have multiple hats that we wear. And so a lot of times, you know, a person that's doing research is also doing the magnet program or doing orientation or doing something else as well. And so a lot of times it's not a dedicated position, but it's somebody who's responsible for nursing research, but also doing something else. And so we have quite a few PhD and DMP prepared nurses that are excellent in our system at doing research and supporting this. And system level research council, we have divisions and we have facilities research councils. And so that is part of my role is supporting that council work and that infrastructure. And we're building up our EVP support through our national nurse residency program, through educating, through going through our councils. Um, and so that's part of the role as well, because it takes both the DMP and a PhD person to build that up and support it together. So There's a lot going on. And then I'm very fortunate enough to be supported in my own trajectory of research. So I have a couple grants that are funded and lines of research that I do as well. There's two questions there. So let's start with the first one. Talk a little bit more about should I should I get a DMP or should I do a PhD? And sometimes the answer to that, well, as always, it depends, but there's a lot of variables. But I do think there's a lot of confusion out in the world about what the DMP is. Maybe Maybe less confusion if you're in a direct practice, if you're a nurse practitioner with a DMP, that is a little clearer to, clearer to folks. But talk about how you partner with the DMP and how that PhD DMP, conceptually, I completely understand it. But if you're not familiar with it, it's kind of, it can be confusing. Yeah, absolutely. So you're right. You know, a DMP can be a clinical practice degree, somebody who's a nurse practitioner carrying out their nurse practitioner role. But in the sense of somebody who's facilitating EVP within a system or in a leadership role, in that sense, it's for somebody who really wants to translate the evidence, who supports that translation of work. And and it's very clear in academia and the program and going to school, it might be less clear in the role or the job that you get. And so, you know, thinking about that future role or job that you're going to receive, even in our CNOs or our leadership position, making sure that it's clear. A lot of times it'll say doctoral degree. And, you know, it's okay if you have a PhD or a DMP, but if you really want to use that degree or put it to work, thinking about how you want that degree for our DMP colleagues who work hand in hand with the PhD, and they're truly using that DMP, they're going to be the ones that are leading EVP programs, right? Educating our nurses in teaching EVP, running fellowship programs, helping EVP project teams, you know, create and generate evidence-based practice projects within the hospital or clinics or other care settings or even in academia. And so they're working on those practice changes, those implementation science projects to help bring the practice change to change those sacred cows. And a lot of times that can look like um, 
research in that, you know, you're going to the evidence, you're, you're researching things, you're creating evidence synthesis tables, but what you're hoping to find is the research is already done, there's strong evidence, and then you're making an implementation protocol to change practice in a current setting. Yeah. So, I mean, it's, it is hard, I think. And it's, I think part of the difficulty of understanding is it's still a fairly new degree. And so there's a lot of confusion and wondering, what does it mean? And I find myself saying to people all the time, it's a clinical doctorate, just like DPT or the DOT. And it's, it's just, it's taken time, I think, for the public and and even other nurses to understand what it is. You've talked a little bit about the different councils and the different regions and the, and the structures, and then you have a corporate research committee. So when you have this large health system, are there projects, research projects that you work on that would, based on the findings, be implemented across the health system? Or is it, mm-hmm. and then is, and then talk a little bit too about anything you're doing like interdisciplinary. I'd be curious to see how you as a nurse scientist interact with other scientists in the research department, if you will, within the system. Yeah, I mean, so we have a Common Spirit Research Institute that goes across our entire system. We're we're a fairly new merge system. So Common Spirit is the merging of Dignity Health and Catholic Health Initiatives. And then we were also joined by Virginia Mason Health Franciscan System. This all just happened in 2019. So if you know about mergers, right, it takes a long time to come together. But we are really actually, and then, you know, of course, a pandemic hit as well, which can delay merging and, you know, the coming together of a system. But we have worked hard to come together as one big common spirit. And so we do have one common spirit research institute and we do work through our divisions to try to kind of garner the benefits of being a health system. If you're going to be one large health system, you should really enjoy those benefits of being a health system. So like my research studies really kind of capitalize on that health system activity for the interdisciplinary work. Like I have done work with our APP and physician group. We've done things like looking at our provider leadership academy. We've done activities where we look at like mentorship programs. So we have research that kind of goes hand in hand on based on who's running the study and we do work together. I just recently ran a research study that looked at mind body skills after our kind of our post COVID area and implementing a mind body skills intervention. And not only did we look at nurse managers, but we pulled in our chaplain group to that as a group that is vulnerable and affected. And then we also pulled in our health at home and hospice managers and leaders. And so kind of research question always drives what you do. Right. And so looking at as a large system, kind of who, who might be available and who's working on it. And then of course, being in a system the opportunity to influence change. That's the best part about being kind of on the industry side. And so I've gotten the opportunity to work a lot with just making change across the system in an evidence-based practice way. Yeah. And I think that's what's probably, I mean, I've only been on faculty once and well, actually more than once, but I was never on any kind of research or tenure track, but, you know, you'd see these scientists doing amazing work and then really having not a lot of influence over what happened with their findings and and not being able to often implement something in a system. So that must be one of the really benefits and rewards of doing the work and then finding the answer, so to speak, and then being able to implement. And that's got to be, that's got to feel really good. Otherwise research, you can feel like you're uh, depending on what you're studying. Sometimes it doesn't immediately impact practice. For the environment. It's absolutely true. Yeah. I mean, yeah. there's there's the 17 year gap of research, <laughs> and, uh, you know, influencing practice, but it is that immediate opportunity to feel valued and hurt, right? If the work you're doing is important. So do you two, and I'm I'm always curious about this with, with some of the research you do, is there a portion of it that's focused on the business running the business? Like if there's a question around oh, I don't know, length of stay or a quality outcome or a cost and quality outcome. Are there those kinds of projects that the system is doing as well? Or is it more clinically 
focused. I'm, I'm always a junkie for any kind of economic finance cost benefit, anything that shows that nursing makes a difference on the bottom. Yeah. Line. I mean, it's a good outcome to have in any study that you do. I think we have a hard time in nursing, adding that outcome into our studies, of course, because nursing is part of the room, right? Right. And so it's difficult to understand the impact that nursing might have, but there's certainly the influence nursing can have on other outcomes. So things like length of stay, fall rates. So I think the advice there is to always make sure that whatever outcomes you're measuring have an effect either on the bottom line, patient safety, quality. And so we always make sure, I mean, clearly if you're writing a grant, um, grant reviewers know this, they're not going to fund anything that isn't going to make a difference or, or make an impact. But also when you're looking at this internally or with any type of argument or case that you're trying to make business case, that's the kind of difference you want to make. It's not that it's not important to say, oh, we educated someone or, you know, we were able to increase satisfaction. Those things are very important, but ultimately in the end, you know, the, the priorities here are making sure that we can operate effectively, that we are efficient, that we save money. And that of course we provide really good quality care and patient safety. Yeah, absolutely. So my last question, talk about, you've been doing some work and research, if you will, and on our some projects that are really national in focus now. You've gone national, right? <laughs> because, and in common spirit, obviously, is a, is a large healthcare organization. So talk about some of the work you were doing that you talked with me about after COVID and wellness and healthy work environments. And we've talked a little bit about nurse suicide and some of those things that we're really starting to tackle now that we've kind of come out of this pandemic. So talk a little bit about that. I, health and wellness project, as I remember, right? I hope. Yeah. So the movement in general, the National Academy of Medicine, even prior to COVID, created the National Action Collaborative on Clinician Wellbeing. So, you know, the, the goal here is that looking at well-being from an organizational perspective, you know, burnout is not an individual's problem. It's an organizational problem. Um, we've, we've learned that after decades of research, we know that organizations need to support their staff and support keeping their staff from being burned out. We, wait, 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 wait. Do you really, st- I, mean, I don't disagree with yeah. you, but do you, but do you think the average nurse frames it that way? I I'm floored to hear you say that. It it is, it is a difference in perspective and I teach it this way, you know, for decades, we thought burnout was a you problem, right? That's why we studied it that way. And honestly, this is the reason why we studied it because we would say, you know, you're burned out, you go home, you get better and you come back. But what happens when you come back, you get burned out again. And that's because burnout comes from the work environment. So if the work environment doesn't change, you're just going to keep getting burned out and you're just going to keep having to go back home. And so all this research that we've determined is it's a work environment issue. This comes from Christina Maslach. This comes from, you know, Beth Stam. This comes from all the work we've done in learning about it. And so that's why we know it's an organizational issue. This came out huge. This came out from the National Academy of Medicine. This was such a big deal that the World Health Organization reclassified burnout in 2019 from an individual diagnosis to an occupational phenomenon. That happened in 2019. Like that's okay, not where that have I been? <laughs> I did not know that. <laughs> so, you know, and then, so in 2019, they came out with this big document um, on six recommendations for organizations to improve their, their work environments, their learning situations, especially for residents, you know, their clinical documentation, all this really good evidence for how to improve their organizations. This was October of 2019. And then what happened in February of 2020? So we were gaining some momentum. You know, we had a worldwide pandemic. The collaborative did really good work in putting out fires and helping as we went through this pandemic. We're on the backside now. We're, we're, we're moving forward. So just recently, they put out the national plan for clinician well-being, very similar to the action plan. So we're back on track and we're getting to the point now where we need to say these organizations, you know, really need to get moving on how we improve 
in our work environments. This is not new to nursing. Nursing's been doing this a long time. This is what MAGNA is. We know right. what a healthy work environment is. The American Association of Critical Care Nurses right. has had our healthy work environment model for a very long time. So we can lead the way in this area. And that's the work that we really need to do. And, and that's the, the place where we need to really work on that implementation science, right? We have right. the evidence, right. we need to implement it. And so we need to show how we get that into action. The other side of this, and this is where, you know, I talked to Lynn Blue in the face, but this is our on our profession. You know, we need to walk the walk. We need to, I was just talking to our nurse residents this week about using our mental health benefit. I don't call it our EAP anymore, but, you know, we need to use our mental health benefit. We need to talk about it. We need to talk about our well-being. We need to turn the dial and say, you know, we need to not brag about our burnout or brag about how hardy we are. We need to brag about how well being, how well we are, you know, what boundaries we can set and what we do. And, you know, we had this conversation at at G&E about social media and how it really can go either way. You know, sometimes we, we kind of go, oh gosh, look at the nurses on social media and maybe they're not representing our profession so well, but Sometimes I look at social media and I go, wow, look at these nurses standing up for themselves. Look at these Mm -hmm. nurses talking about their well-being, talking about how they set their boundary, about their trauma and their stress, but how they're getting over it. And so I'm really, really, really impressed with the nurses. And I see them talking about it, reducing stigma because they're talking about it. And that's where we need to get. That's what we need to do. Right. Well, and I love what you said about I did an, I did a prior video on the EAP because there was that was a perfect opportunity as hospitals were looking for solutions to look at the EAP and because it's I think the percentage of employees that use their EAP is like 2%. I mean it's a paltry number. Yeah. And it is a lot of it's related to stigma or re- concerns about retaliation. But nonetheless, that is a resource that's there for every employee, for their, you know, their families, depending on how the plan is written. And it is a perfect time to relook at that benefit for all the nurses. And I think, and I talked, when I talked to Sarah Delgado, Dr. Delgado from AAC, and she did talk about the healthy work environment standards. And then also the American Organization of Nurse Leaders created some standards around healthy work environments. So for those of you who are listening, who are interested, we will make those resources available because I've heard it here for the first time. <laughs> Burnout is an, is an organizational problem. I'm, I'm actually pretty, I'm pretty on top of those things. So I was, that's, but I, you know, it makes perfect sense because the worst thing is just coming back into the same environment. So we do have some work to do. Well, I think it sounds like the day in the life of a nurse scientist is never the same. Every day is different, <laughs> right? That's not right? Yeah. You're doing a little research. You're doing a little grant writing. You're doing lots of meetings. You're working on plans to implement solutions. So it, it, there's the piece of that that sounds really exciting to me though, is the implementation and implementing well-being programs and seeing the organization improve and, and grow and be better, a better place to work. You don't necessarily have that feeling if you're in academia. So when you're doing your work, so this has been, do you, I mean, this has been fabulous. So do you want to put a pitch in for anybody who wants to be a nurse scientist? <laughs> like, it's a great, I mean, because there aren't a lot of you. And I wonder when people look at your business card and go nurse scientists, they're probably <laughs> it like, is true. I, I do have to explain, you know, and I think a lot of times we talk about burnout a lot. We talk about compassion fatigue a lot, but I always remind people to talk about the other side of the equation, which is compassion, satisfaction, or joy in work. And so it's figuring out what fills your bucket. And, you know, I just was fortunate enough to figure out that research fills my bucket. I'm an analytical person. I love answering questions. I love doing the digging. I love reading. I love getting to the heart of, you know, what makes things work. So, you know, when you, if that is the bug that bites you and that's something that's of interest to you, I think that nursing research is a really great place to land. So, yeah. And did you like your, I mean, like, I shouldn't use that very (laughs) loaded word, but did you know in your undergraduate research course, you were like, this is for me. 
Is that, <laughs> is that what sort of started you? You or? know, that is a hard question because, you know, what are we like 18, 19? Is that, <laughs> do you like any of your courses at that time? But I do kind of yeah. remember reading or, you know, a lot of complaints. And I remember teaching research afterwards and saying, you know, everybody complained about this course and I'm going to make it fun for you. I don't know if I actually did make it fun for them, but I do remember reading the articles and going, this is so bad. I like these things. You know, what's everybody complaining about? (laughs) Well, that's how I am too. I'm a junkie for a good conceptual framework. (laughs) That makes my heart sing when I'm reading a paper. But anyway, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This has been so interesting and looking forward to if you have any, do you want us to, we can put a couple of citations in of your work. If you want to send me a couple, we'll include those. Thank you for joining me today. Thank you for all of our audience for coming and listening. If you have any questions or comments or need any of the references or some of the standards that we've talked about today, just please let us know. And you can find us at hire.vivian.com. And thank you, Leslie.